So I want to thank you all for being here. And we're here to celebrate the publication of Juno Dawson's new book, a picture book called You Need to Chill, the story of a family member's transgender coming out told through the eyes of their younger sister is a call to kindness and understanding necessary to audiences of all ages. Juno Dawson is the international best-selling author of fiction and nonfiction for young adults. Her works include the highly acclaimed This Book is Gay, as well as What's the Tea? She is a columnist for Attitude Magazine and a key LGBTQ plus activist with the charity Stonewall. A former teacher specializing in behavior studies, Juno now writes full-time and lives in Brighton, England. So please welcome Juno Dawson. I'm just going to put this down because it feels like it feels like a rampart separating separating me from you. Oh, now we're, now we're connected. Hello. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I've just had a tour of this museum. What an amazing space. If, if you've not been before, it's really, really magic. I've just had the most fun playing on the little video games because actually I'm a child, it turns out. And if you if you do get a chance to vote for your favorite American books as well, mine were really pleasingly lowbrow. Um, it was Stephen King, Judy Bloom, and Ray Bradbury. Um, so yeah, see if you can see if you can take it, lower the tone even more. Um I'm going to speak for about half an hour. I'm just going to I'm going to imagine that nobody's read me and nobody has read anything that I've written. So I'm just going to kind of just introduce you to who I am. Um, I've come a long way from home. And um, thank you to my publisher Sourcebooks for bringing me over for the American Library Association Conference in Chicago this weekend. It's such an honor to be here. Um, obviously, back back in the early days in the earliest days of my career, everybody knows you're not famous until you're America famous. So it doesn't matter how many number one Sunday Times bestsellers I've had, it's, it means nothing until I have a New York Times bestseller. So we're, we're still working on that. Thanks, buy my books, thanks. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Juno. Um, I come from, um, if you have ever read or seen Game of Thrones, I come from Winterfell. <laughs> I, I come from not quite north of the wall, but you can see the wall from, from where I live. Um, it's the same, I come from the same city as Scary Spice, Melanie B. Um, but because a lot of Americans don't understand what I'm saying, if I rarely use my original accent, so I just can't talk like this all night. So um, I'll, I'll, it's the way I used to speak to children. Um, so I used to, I used to be a primary school teacher um, in the South. I live in Brighton, which is if you've seen Portlandia, that's Brighton. It's vegans and queer people and a lot of Birkenstocks. Um, it's great, it's a vibe. Um, so I, I first moved down there to become a primary school teacher and I started borrowing the books from the young people in my class. I was teaching year six, which is the 11 and 12 year olds. And it was just the golden era of young adult fiction. I was like, why are all these girls so into this freaking Apple novel? Like, what is it about this Apple that is making 12 year old girls have little whispery conversations? And of course it was Twilight, um, just raising a generation of girls who want nothing more than to die for their husband's baby. And then calling it Renesme, which feels like adding insult to injury. But it was it was an amazing, it was an amazing era for like the golden era of young adult fiction. There was the Hunger Games, there was Knots and Crosses, the rise of John Green, and in the the English equivalent Mallory Blackman. If if I don't think Knots and Crosses was quite the same level of wow in the states as it was in the uk it's an amazing sort of dystopian look at race in like a race flipped world um and it was actually it was mallory blackman's book it was knots and crosses i shared it with my class i read it and i thought to myself if you were ever going to write a novel you should write for young adults because you can do everything like that novel it is a dystopia, it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, it's exciting, it's about terrorism, and is there ever, is, can there ever be justification for terrorism? So it's deeply philosophical, it has a lot to say about race and society, gender, class, and I was like, how wonderful, and how wonderful that in the young adult section of the bookshop, all the books get to hang out together. Like whether you're writing horror or romance, you only have to go to one stop in the bookshop. It's not like in the downstairs grown-up section. 
And especially for me, there, were, there was something, given that this would have been like, what, 2007, 2008, there was still there was still the gay interest section. It wasn't even called the LGBTQ section. It was the gay interest section. And it was always on like the 19th floor of the bookshop of like our equivalent of Barnes and Noble. And you would kind of go up like three escalators and four bookshelves and you'd find this dusty little shelf like underneath the philosophy and tarot cards and there'd be like gay interest and it would just be like a row of copies of tales of the city which is amazing oh and, and possibly a sarah waters novel like fingersmith or tipping the velvet if you were lucky and that was it so i loved that within the ya section i also saw an opportunity to get gay interest out of that top shelf because i knew if i wrote young adult fiction that happened to feature some like incidental queer characters that you know it would still be in the young adult section with john green and the hunger games because no one would know and so that's what i did when i was um we we have an adult audience so i can be confessional it's fine quickly scream now if there's a child in the room we're fine and um so at the time, so this was pre my transition, and I was going out with a guy who worked for British Airways, he was cabin crew, and they go away for huge periods of time on end, they would vanish off for like days on end, he'd be in Singapore for like eight days or something. And so of course, I was really mindful of accidentally cheating on him, because that can sometimes happen. And it's not your fault if you are left alone. It's just... <laughs> I didn't ask him to be cabin crew. And so I thought I need, I need a little hobby that is going to keep me busy. And it was the six week holidays. All I had planned to do was watch America's Next Top Model and read on the beach. And it rained every single day. It was horrible. There was no reading on the beach. It was miserable. So I thought I need something to do. And so I thought, right, I'm going to have a go at writing a queer YA novel. I did that thing that a lot of debut writers do was I literally based it exactly on me and my friends when we were in high school, write what you know. The only twist was I was like, what if we were also very powerful witches who could kill the people who called us goths and gays and weirdos? And that really appealed as like a weird sort of like revenge fantasy. And that was Hollow Pike. That was my first book. And, and I'm, do you know, I'm pleased to say to say it was 2011 when I got that book deal, I wasn't challenged on the fact that of the four main characters, three of them were queer. Nobody ever said, you can't do this. Um, oh, that's too risque. I'd kind of figured it's like the dirty glass hypothesis that if you leave a dirty glass, nobody will mention anything else. So I figured like, if I put in like three queer characters, maybe they'll let me keep one of them, but they let me keep all three. And that was that was how I started. That was how I got my first deal. Um, everybody said, every single person at my original publisher said, don't give up your day job. So literally the first thing I did was give up my day job. And then from that day forth, I was always like Maleficent at Aurora's christening. Like every time somebody gets like a six figure advance, I drift in all wearing black and say, it doesn't last as long as you think. And then sidle back out. Um, because do you know what your agent is going to take like 20% and then the tax man is going to take literally the rest of it. Um, but I did, I, I gave up my day job and decided I was going to take a year out to work on my second novel. And I'm still on my year out 12 years later. So, I'm, so I'm not doing bad, but it, but it was a hustle. And this is, this is where I get to my first little reading of the night. So that, that money that I thought was mom, I thought it was riches beyond my wildest dreams. I thought that money was gonna last me a good 50 years. Um, that was not the case. So very quickly I realized you've moved to London to be to make it as a writer. And I realized, oh my gosh, this was madness. You are really poor now. And I wasn't quite sure what to do. But I had, in my last days of my teaching career, I had kind of partly left the classroom. I was only doing three days in front of young people. And the other two days, I was working for what was called the Healthy Schools Foundation, which kind of sounds like a pro-life death cult, but it wasn't. It was actually a good thing. The Healthy Schools Foundation, they released me from the classroom and I would go around schools in the Sussex Education Authority advising on PSHE, which is personal social health education. And in particular, it was noted that I was very, very good at teaching sex education. 
I had been part of a government trial to modernize the teaching of sex education, which made it much more young person focused, where the idea was rather than rather than teaching the young people about the birds and the bees, you would kind of say, what do you want to know? Because by this point, we were in the smartphone generation. And the fact of the matter was 11 and 12 year olds had heard things that would make your toes curl, but they didn't really understand them. All, all the internet had given them was fears and questions and queries. And so that was my whole thing. I sort of went into classrooms and we had a little anonymous box where each child could just ask that burning question. I was like, if you could ask anything without being shamed or laughed at or mocked, what would it be? I, and I would say in a class of 32 young people, maybe two would take the piss, basically. I don't know what the American equivalent of taking the piss is. Does that work? Is that a thing? Um, they would abuse the, the offer that was given and ask a ridiculous question that they definitely already knew the answer to. But the other 30 kids, they really did use it. They used that opportunity to ask that thing that they half understood. The, from doing this for about three years, the most commonly asked question, and this is, I'm not making this up, but it was, why do my parents have sex if they don't want any more children? And what that said really loud and clear is that nobody was teaching young people that sex ought to be pleasurable. You know, and, and as, a, as a committee of teachers, we were like, well, then sex education has failed. We have failed. We're, ju we're just teaching kids how babies are made. And that's cool, but we need to do a lot, lot more. And so I knew there was a huge gap in the market. And so I went to my publisher. By this point, I was writing sort of teen horror um, and it was selling moderately well. I wrote a book about Bloody Mary that did quite well. But I sort of went to them and said, what if we did like a sex education book, especially for young LGBTQ people? And what if we called it This Book is Gay? Because at the time it was that prime prime South Park era of if something was rubbish, if something was naff or useless, it got called gay. And it used to drive me mad in the playground when I would hear children say, oh my God, your sneakers are so gay. And I would always pull them up and I'd say, how are they making out with other boy sneakers? You know, in what way are those sneakers gay? Do they have great taste in clothes? Do they love musicals? You know, what is it? What is it that makes these sneakers gay? And obviously the children would just shrivel of shame but you know I, I was kind of like, well let's try to reclaim that by making a book that is gay and lesbian and bi and trans and let's do that and luckily hockey books in the uk said well we think this is a wonderful idea do, off, off you bob here's some money off you go and what i what i didn't realize at the time was how much this book was was going to change my life I really, really hoped it was going to change the lives of, of young people. I knew from when I was a teenager in the mid 90s, I think that's fair to say without giving my exact age away. Um, okay, I'm really old. All right. It's just Botox. It's just hormones and Botox. Let's just move on. But um, I, I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing when I was a teenager and you know I knew I knew shame and I knew fear I grew up very much under the shadow of HIV and AIDS you know I remember in the UK we had this awful public advert voiced by John Hurt of the elephant man fame and it, and it was I mean it, you can see it on YouTube it's terrifying and it's like it, there's this huge gravestone that's t that topples down and crushes a bunch of people with John Hurt going, there's a new disease that does not care if you're a man or a woman or gay or straight. And then a bunch of people get crushed to death by a giant gravestone that says AIDS. And as a young queer kid, I was like, man, this looks great. Like, sign me up. Like, te just terrifying. You know, to to be queer in the '90s was was a really scary thing, and and nobody was helping. I also grew up under a piece of legislation called Section Twenty Eight, 
and um, Margaret Thatcher introduced it. Boo. Margaret Thatcher introduced it in the 80s and it was in response to a children's book. It was a picture book like you need to chill. It was called Jenny lives with Eric and Martin and it's about a little girl called Jenny who has two dads. It was it's super 70s, the handlebar mustaches, the the little vest with the tiny short shorts. It's it's a vibe. But the Daily Mail reported that um, like it was gay propaganda in our schools. You know, it, it's lovely how far we've come on, isn't it? But we'll get to that. But um, Margaret Thatcher decided to make a big thing of it and she used Section 28, the exact wording of which was, local authority educational resources must not promote um, homosexual lifestyle as a pretended family arrangement basically and that would mean that teachers librarians social workers could lo lose their job if they promoted homosexuality and the weird wording of it sort of clamped silence down on schools teachers were terrified to talk about being lgbtq in case they lost their job so even though i was just a beacon of queerness from about five years old. And my teachers could see how hard I was finding school and they could see the way that the other kids talked to me. They just, they couldn't or didn't step in. I remember one teacher tried to help. She was a gay woman, but because she couldn't be out as a lesbian, there wasn't a lot she could do. So she kind of, she sort of like ushered me into the drama club and you know, she, I think she slightly inflated my English grade, <laughs> but, but that was, that was, you know, that was about as much as she could do. I remember one of the PE teacher, I'd, I'd had the crap kicked out of me in a PE lesson. And I remember one of the teachers saying, who was it? And I was like, it was all of them. And he said, well, it can't be all of them. And I was like, it was all of them. And that was what school was like. And I knew that had there been a book like This Book is Gay that talked about identity and coming out, if it offered wisdom from gay elders of 25 or 26 years old, you know, I, it could have just been a bit of a map to get me through what I think is the most turbulent period of a young queer person's life. But the problem is you can never guarantee that a book is going to find its way to readers. And anyway, I'm going to do my first little reading, a little segment from This Book is Gay, um, which it depends how old you are of how amusing you're going to find this segment. And this section is called A High Sex Thoughts. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. I guess you're reading this book for one of several reasons. It may be because you already identify as LGBTQ+, and let's face it, we live nothing more than talking about it. Maybe you're nosy to see what we get up to between the sheets. It could be you're making fun of this book because it has the word gay in the title, in which case, shame on you. But maybe, just maybe, you picked up this book. Come down, there's, some, there's plenty of room at the front. Come, come on down. Every, every straight line is a catwalk. Work it. There you go, fashion. But maybe, just maybe, you picked up this book because you're wondering. It all starts with wondering. Wondering what it might be like to kiss that boy or what that girl's body looks like. What life would be like if you were a girl, not a guy. It's all about wondering. Wondering is perfectly natural, but never ever encouraged. One day, I was in the park sunbathing. On the next picnic blanket over, a mother was talking to her son about the things he could do when he was an adult. The conversation went something like this. Boy, drive a car. Mum, yes. Boy, go to work. Mum, yes. Boy, kissing. Mum, yes, girls, you will kiss girls. After I had snatched that child away and left him with social services. Okay, I didn't do that, but I probably have done something other than stare really loudly. I was sad at how that mum still defaulted to heterosexual in the 21st century. 
The assumption goes that all babies are born both straight and cisgender unless something goes wrong, but this is not the case. In a 2018 Gallup poll, the percentage of American adults identifying as LGBTQ plus was 4.5%, which equates to more than 11 million people, roughly the number of people who live in Ohio. A 2016 Williams Institute study estimates there are just over 1.3 million transgender adults living in the US. And yet we're all automatically straight and cis. How? Let's look at sexuality first. You're told you're straight and assume you're straight for almost all of your childhood, despite any compelling feelings to the contrary. You believe yourself to be straight because, like, isn't everyone? until sexual desire kicks in. Assuming it does, it doesn't always for everyone. I like to call this desire sex thoughts. Because most of us spend our childhood identifying as straight, even if we're not straight, we don't always identify these thoughts as sex thoughts. But it seems highly likely that from a youngish age, we as LGBTQ people were attracted to members of the same sex, be it people we know or shiny TV people. I wanted to know at what age LGBTQ plus people first had questioning thoughts regarding their sexuality and or their gender. So I surveyed hundreds of them. As you can see, you can't see, I've got a little table, but you can, you'll just have to believe me. Almost a quarter of the sample were having same sex sex thoughts and or thoughts regarding their gender just before puberty with well over half at puberty. And this makes sense. Because like in the X-Men, puberty is the time at which great changes occur. One big change is the hormonal shift that drives us towards sexual relationships. It's at this point many of us realize the thoughts we're having late at night might be about people with the same body as us. A scandalo. For me, it was Dean Kane. Dean Kane, as if you don't know, was the very handsome actor who played Clark Kent in Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Up until Dean Kane came into my life, I was convinced I was going to marry Kelly, a girl in my class whose name I have changed for her protection because she was kind and blonde. However, what I felt for Dean Kane, whose name I did not change for this book because it is time he knew was very different to what I felt for Kelly. My interest in spandex clad arms was far more pressing than being fond of Kelly and her hair. And when Clark got together with Lois, I felt the most intense jealousy of my life. Later, after a massive crush on a male teacher, I had to acknowledge that these feelings went beyond mere appreci appreciation of the male form and were in fact sex, sex thoughts. At the time, I thought I was a boy, and this had huge implications for my identity. Well, shit. There you go. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> what I didn't realize when I was writing This Book is Gay was how much of an impact it was going to have on me. Because I was really, really keen that this was not just a book about my somewhat privileged experience, um, I, it was really, really important that I spoke to a bunch of other LGBTQ people. I wanted it to fully represent the whole community. Initially, I was writing with the, the UK in mind, but I also spoke to some American people as well. And, and it was during this process that I met real life in the flesh trans people. Now, I'd seen trans people on TV. I wasn't a hermit. I, by this point, we had had a woman called Nadia who had won series five of Big Brother in the UK. But there was something about Nadia's experience and my experience that didn't just join, it just didn't join up. Even though she was in that Big Brother house for the whole run, she won it, which I think is an indication of the different culture in 2005 to now. I just, I still didn't see myself in Nadia. But there was something about meeting real life people in and around London that really changed everything. These were trans people about my age. They were English. They were working in the creative industries there were people like me basically and all of a sudden i felt this very strange jealousy 
I remember meeting an amazing woman called Isla Holden. She is an RAF helicopter pilot, or at least she was. She now works for the police. Mm -hmm. But she's still a trans helicopter pilot, which is really cool. Um, and I was just so struck at how, how gorgeous she was, how lovely and kind she was, how her relationship with her wife was so positive. How I first, the first time I met her in real life, she'd brought her mum to an award ceremony we were both at. And I was kind of like, this isn't fair. You know, why does she get to be a girl? Like, I always wanted to be a girl. You know, when I was five, I used to make little deals with God that, you know, if I kept my bedroom tidy, I could be a girl. And when I was sitting down to interview trans people for this book, both trans men and trans women, they were all saying the same thing about those deals with God, about how if they were good, would they magically change gender, how they used to ask their parents when they would change gender, um, constant conversations about if I was a girl, what would I have been called? If I was a girl, you know, would I do this? If I was a girl, would I do this? And I just never joined the dots. I'd never realized that that experience was the trans experience, or at least a trans experience. And, and it was it was a lot while writing a very difficult book to write, in some ways quite traumatic, dealing with stereotypes and the persecution of gay people, the religious persecution of gay people, um, the, the difficulties of accessing gender affirming healthcare, also, I was with a really hot boyfriend at the time and we were breaking up and it was really disappointing because he was really tall and handsome. So there was just a lot going on. And so it was a really, really difficult, difficult book. But it has a happy ending. A, thank goodness, it, it was never too late. Yes, I was 28 by the time I worked out was trans. Maybe it would have been cute to transition younger, but actually I was having a really nice time in my 20s. It was fun. And so it's very hard to regret my young, single, gay life in gay London. I was having a blast. So there's, there is only so regretful I can be. But the book came out first in the UK in 2014, and then it was published in the US by Source Books in 2015. And so it's nearly 10 years now. And I just always hoped that the book would find young queer people. And it did. And I know that now because those first kids who were reading it when they were 13, 14, 15, they're in their mid to late 20s now. And they're much more inclined to come up to me at things like this and tell me the ways that this book helped, how their parents bought it for them because they had concerns and they were like, we've got you this present and we think this could maybe, you know, you could read this with your friends or you could give it to a friend, you know, or, you know, I remember I was I was on the tube a while ago in London and, and a, just this professional young woman came up to me and said, are you Juna Doss? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, you know, your book, this book is gay is how I came out to my mum. And I was like, well, this is why we did it. I wanted, I wanted young queer people to get to adulthood. And it's only now, 10 years on that I'm seeing they did. They made it, they survived, they got there. Jo Locke from Heartstopper came bounding over at the Attitude Awards last year. And he was like, oh my gosh, your book like changed my life. And I'm like, well, now you're in Heartstopper. So that's amazing. And you're gonna be in, you're gonna be in the Marvel MCU. So good for you and well done me, creating the next generation of the MCU. Well done me. But yeah, but now I, I, I now, now, of course the flip side of that as, as it did find queer writers, it also, you know, as it became more popular and as it sold more copies, it's, it's got itself into a spot of bother. You know, a book that looks like this, that is called This Book Is Gay and features sex education for young LGBTQ people wasn't going to avoid people <laughs> who want to ban books like this one. So, you know, I'm here, I'm here for the ALA conference where I'm gonna be talking about banned books. Um, I'm, I think I'm currently at number nine in the ninth mass band books in the US at the moment. And it does, it does, it just makes me sad. You know, it's how far we've come, you know, and yet, you know, however, however many heart stoppers or glees or, you know, Troy Savans there are, we, we still have a cultural situation where the young queer youth of America are being told there is something inherently controversial about them 
they're not trying to ban the book, they're trying to ban them. That's what it's really about. It's about saying, we, we don't want a culture where young queer people can thrive. That, that's, you know, that's what a bunch of people in the US are saying, and they're trying to sort of create that environment. I don't think they're gonna win. I don't think they're gonna win for a second for a couple of reasons. I think if you say to people, so, what you're saying is you want big government to tell you what you can and can't read. Nobody wants that. Nobody on, on either side of the political divide wants government mandated reading, you know, because a lot of really awful racist books would be banned under the legislation they seem to be pushing for, kind of. So I think that that's the, there is a logical flaw in trying to ban books, because if, if you are a OK with banning books, that's your books you're going to ban as well. That's everybody's books. Um, but but more than that, I think this is not something anybody wants. This is not something anybody in the United Kingdom or in, in America wants. You know, I think there are conversations about kind of age rating books or age banding books. That's a different conversation. But I think it's a strange hill that a very small minority of people are trying to weaponize politically. But I don't think there is any political hunger for it really in this country. And so I think that's why they will lose. But I also think as well, there is a lot of still, even now, even here, I think there's so much to celebrate and there is so much queer joy. And I think queer joy, I think joy of any kind, I think ice cream joy, I think queer joy, I think any kind of joy is infectious. People want a piece of joy. Nobody wants a piece of hate. It's a sad, obsessive little hobby where you can kind of, you're in a strange little echo chamber kind of affirming each other's beliefs, but it doesn't look chic. I'm gonna say something potentially controversial now, but have you ever seen a hot turf? No. That's, and I'm just, I'm just gonna leave it there. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not a, it's not something that anybody wants to be a part of. Um, and I think that's why that's not gonna win out. It's people, people want to be part of pride. People want to be a part of joy. And I think when I look at things like Heartstopper, which is selling millions and millions of copies, I've been on tour with Alice Erzman around the UK. Her following is like an army of pastel clad, non-binary, nose ring, demisexual, pansexual, asexual joy, you know, and there are so many more people coming through and celebrating that than there are people with multiple Twitter accounts trolling authors, you know, it's, that's, it's not chic. It's just not chic. And that's why I don't think there's any traction in it. And so I'm going to end with the new one before we go over to Q&A. Um, I'm going to end with You Need to Chill, which I think is a very different kind of thing. And I think it's great that we have books which are taking on issues full steam ahead, like this book, book is gay, like Gender Queer. I think these books are wonderful, but I think it is nice to have something just a little bit cute as well. So... I don't care that you're all adults. Who doesn't love being read to? So enjoy, let, your, let yourself go sleepy. It's, it's sleepy nap time. We'll bring out some warm milk. No, we won't, because you can't buy milk anywhere in America is what I've recently learned. Have I had a cup of tea in eight days? No, I haven't. Please, someone, please. Um, I feel deprived, cultural insensitivity. Um, you need to chill. Sometimes people say to me, what happened to your brother, Bill? We haven't seen him in ages. Is he hiding? Is he ill? Is he lost in the park? Is he scared of the dark? Is he doing his homework still? That's when I look them in the eye and say, hey, you need to chill. Was he eaten by a whale or shark? Was he munched up just like krill? That simply isn't true, I say. And hey, you need to chill. Is he on vacation in Barbados or Brazil? 
No one has gone anywhere. And hey, you need to chill. Is he at the zoo? Is he at the fair? Is he searching for a thrill? Although we do love the Ferris wheel. Hey, you need to chill. I really love the penguin on the Helter Skelter. That's my, but I had to really fight for it as well. My editor in the UK was like, I don't really understand why there's a penguin on the slide. Why wouldn't there be a penguin on the slide, Karen? But we're so confused and we're so concerned. We cannot rest until we find out what's happened to your older brother, Bill. Did he tumble down and hurt himself? Have they given him a pill? Is he on the pool or on the field showing off his skill? Was he taken to Mars by aliens? Is he on their spaceship still? Stop, I say, that's enough. Hey, you need to chill. There are no hungry whales, no little green men. Your hysteria is silly. The truth is that my brother Bill is now my sister, Lily. It was maybe quite a shock at first, but she's really just the same. She looks a little different and she has a new first name. I love that this book is gay is on the floor. The, the MCU, it's a Juniverse. She's still clever and funny and kind and cool. She's one in a mill. And if people have a problem, we shout. Hey, you need to chill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that one came about, I was actually asked to write that one. It was my, my editor found herself in that situation with her niece is a teenage trans girl. And she was like, do you know what? If there'd been a book that explained what was happening in the family to her younger siblings, it would have made all the difference. So that's where You Need to Chill came from. And it just came out beginning of May, again with source books. So again, thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. Okay, over to you. Questions, comments. If not, I'm going to sing, and that would be a punishment. <laughs> so, someone has to be brave. There we go. Thank you, brave soul. And I read some research first as well that if a woman speaks first at a publishing event, then more women are much more likely to speak. Whereas if a man asks the first question, women are far less likely to speak. There we go. I actually don't have a question at the moment. Okay. But I just wanted to say thank you. I think that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. I'm definitely, I, while you were speaking earlier, I don't know if you saw me, but I definitely went back here and purchased another book. Um, this is going to be extremely helpful with my daughter. I have an 11 year old who's trying to figure it all out because mommy just got engaged to a woman. So this is fun. <laughs> I also have a mentoring group called Breakthrough, and a lot of my kids are just, this is where we're at right here. So this is going to be amazing. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here in the room, in the space with you. So thank, thank you. you. I think you're right. I think, I think even as, okay, technically I'm a geriatric millennial, a phrase which does make me want to put my head <laughs> in the oven. But so technically, I am I think I'm the first year that I could be classed as a millennial. And I think it's really interesting. So clearly not necessarily Gen X, not a boomer, but definitely not Gen Z. But I think sometimes even I look at those young people who come to Ali Sersman's events or come to my events, and it is, it is a different culture to the one that I grew up in. And I think as, as a geriatric millennial, I have as much to learn from a 16, 17 year old as I do to teach. And I sometimes wonder if that's a danger of something that can happen with older people, which is because we don't understand the world teenagers occupy, both the real world and the online world, which, you know, these are, we're well into digital natives now, young people who have always, always had very high quality broadband. 
we can't, I can't understand that. So we are actually dealing with, with a generation of people who probably know more than I do. And so I'm not going to sit here as the jug of information as kind of like Rafiki and Lion King, just like pouring out the knowledge to the children, like a big jug kind of, because I think it's a two way street. And I think I have as much to learn from young and especially, you know, the, the in some ways, my my transition is is quite you know the the classic addition, where you know I I knew my whole life that I wanted to be a woman, and so I made the decision ten years ago that I was going to take every opportunity to do that. You know, legally, medically, you know, I was I was going to really do the whole deluxe trans package. Whereas you know when I go into schools. And I speak to young people who identify as non-binary, genderqueer, gender fluid, gender non-conforming, um, you know, you know, trans non-binary, you know, so infinite, infinite things. And to them, they're saying to me, you know, you need to chill. You know, what's you know, why why are you so keen? You know, we don't have to have it pinned down. You know, we don't have to have everything done. And I think that does unsettle adult lawmakers. I think it unsettles some educators. I think it unsettles a lot of parents. But I think we we just have to acknowledge that they are steering their own ship. And I think we have to we have to let them. But I think it's exciting. I think you can choose to be scared or you can choose to be excited for this kind of wonderland that young queer people find themselves living in and in a way be grateful, even with everything going on politically, that I think they've got, we've made progress. And I think young people know there's still a long way to go. I don't think they need telling that, you know, there's still work to be done or there's still a fight to fight. Cause I think, I think they're fully aware of that. And I think the future's in really quite safe hands. You did, you did something daring in the sense of quitting your job and deciding to do something full time writing. Can you talk about that a little bit more? And are you a writer in the sense that you have a, a basic mission to do it? Or have you ever thought like, gee, I'd like to write a novel? Or, mm. you know, do you have some other other ideas on uh, ideas to cultivate? So yeah, so I've been I've been busy. So I've spoken about because I'm here with source books this week. I've been talking about my source books, but last year I had my first adult novel came out last year called Her Majesty's Royal Coven. Um, it was a Barnes and Noble pick, so it did it did very well. Thank you, Barnes and Noble. Um, and yeah, that that was a big deal for me. That was my first novel to be released in the United States, but in the UK. I'm as known for my young adult fiction. So I've basically had a novel out every year since 2012. And that was A, because I love writing and it's still nothing, nothing gives me more joy than a day where I've got nothing in the diary and I can go to my little office and just write. And they're few and far between because the more, the more successful you become, the less you are able to write, which is like a weird kind of paradox. But I've never been short of ideas. Um, but having so Her Majesty's Royal Coven went to number one in the UK. It was a Sunday Times bestseller, and that that was a moment. That was a real moment. And the success of the trilogy has meant that for the first time since I quit my day job, I can chill a bit because it was it was it made financial not a lick of sense to give up my job. You know, I've had to work insanely hard, you know, doing nonfiction, fiction, picture books, the journalism I do as well back in the UK. I've had to work so hard. So the success of Her Majesty's Royal Coven, which apparently I can't say, Her Majesty's Royal Coven, um, it did well enough that my publisher in the UK has immediately signed me up for another three novels. So I can, I can relax. So I basically, when I get back to London on Tuesday, you're not going to see me again. I'm, I'm going full. I'm going, I'm going back in the cave, like that little funny groundhog. And you'll, you'll see me the next time a book comes out, which I think will be probably next June. So bye. See ya. Okay. Hi. So you've written, this book is gay and what's the tea. And now you need to chill, which, um, you know, uh, reaches a different audience. Are you, do you have thoughts about, um, 
where else you might like to write in the in the YA nonfiction space? Is there more areas you think that need covered that are gaps in like the space? <laughs> After every single nonfiction book, I have said I'm never doing another nonfiction book ever again. And I have, think I've done like four now. Um, it's really hard. Writing nonfiction is hard because society just will not stand still. It's so frustrating. So we've revised This Book is Gay three times. At one point, when I first wrote the book in 2013, it was legal to be a gay man in India then it was illegal to be a gay man in India. And now it's legal again. So we have to kind of keep updating it. It's it's this constant shifting sands. Um, so it's hard. Um, adapting this book is gay for the American audience is one of the single hardest things I've ever done because you just do not have national laws. And so I was kind of like, this is so difficult. And actually when it came to writing, what's the tea? which is the trans and non-binary specific follow-up to this book is gay. I had to throw my hands up to my American editor, Steve, and I was just like, I cannot in good faith advise young trans Americans on healthcare because I grew up with an NHS. I do not understand your healthcare system. I would not even know what a 13 year old trans kid is meant to do. I just, and so luckily Steve was like, we've got you, we've got it covered. We're going to get some kind of some trans people in to kind of fact check. You don't need to worry about that because I knew from writing this book is gay that I felt really worried about kind of offering bad advice kind of. So yeah, nonfiction is really, really hard. And I will say, I think fiction is my first love. It is what brings me the most joy, but I strongly suspect that when a giant gravestone falls on me, it will have this book is gay on it. I think that is, that is the book that I'm gonna be remembered for. And, and I think what an amazing legacy to leave. You know, I think if, if it is this book is gay that I'm remembered for, I'm absolutely fine with that. And, but never say never, because what's the tea in particular came out of, and actually to, in, to some extent you need to chill as well, came out of rage. And I think rage, queer rage is a very powerful thing. And again, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of talking about the state of trans rights in the United Kingdom, but I was furious that in the depths of a pandemic, the media, some quite famous people online still found plenty of oxygen to talk about trans youth and trans kids and trans rights and how scary trans women are. And so I was furious. And, and so that's what got me back in front of a computer to write What's the Tea. I almost didn't want to write What's the Tea. I felt there was a real burning need for it. And, and I knew that if I was feeling anxious, if I, I was feeling positively foreboding about the state of trans rights in the UK, that I knew young trans people might be experiencing anxiety as well. And so while I haven't got any plans to do any more nonfiction just now, there might come a day when I'm so furious again that I feel it is. I, although I will say this, I felt very let off the hook by an amazing book that you can absolutely buy in the US. And it makes me really sad it hasn't done as well in the US as it did in the UK, which is a book called The Transgender Issue by Sean Fay. And um, it's published by Penguin in the US, I think. I don't know. You can, ab I've seen it. I've seen it in bookshops since I got here. Um, and Sean's book, is everything I wanted to say in a way that I couldn't have delivered it because I'm too emotional and I get furious. Whereas Sean used to be a lawyer. So Sean has really set out, this is the current state of play for trans rights in the United Kingdom. And she keeps this incredible level head. And I do think it's gonna be a definitive text that we talk about in 20, 30 years time. Um, I think, I would encourage everybody to read that. And I think Elliot Page's book is gonna be one of those really important texts as well. Um, so it's almost like, I don't feel the need, but that's lovely because sometimes there aren't many trans writers who are given the opportunities that I've been given, but it, it can feel like a bit of pressure as well. So it's always really lovely when other trans writers come through as well. Cause you're like, oh my gosh, I don't need to do it. Because it is, it's quite traumatizing. And how I think Sean, I know Sean well, and I think she did find that book difficult when you're dealing with 
the level of transphobic rhetoric that trans people have to swallow at the moment. It must have been quite a triggering book to write. And now I don't have to write it. Hooray. Great. Um, if there's not another question, can I ask one? Of course. Who was the first writer, whether they were gay or not gay, but whose work affected you um, and talked to your issues as being a young gay man or being trans? Who were those writers? Yeah, it was, it was tough. I mean, I was, I was quite a difficult reader, actually, as a young adult, in that I was, like a lot of young adults, I liked what I liked, and I would not be told otherwise. So I read a lot of Doctor Who fiction. I loved, loved, loved Point Horror, Goosebumps, R.L. Stein, Judy Bloom, and Forever Taught Me What Sex Was. Um, and so I, I, oh, and Nancy Drew, a lot of Nancy Drew case files as well, which were like the 90s reboot of Nancy Drew. I was worryingly old when I learned Carolyn Keene is not a real person. Devastating. It's like, well, but how? How was she not writing 12 books a week? <laughs> like, I should have really figured it out, shouldn't I? But um, I remember, so there was two books which were really sort of foundational to me as a queer person. The first, and I, 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 this, sorry, I'm, I'm really, really sorry if I'm getting this wrong. I've forgotten the name he goes by now, but the author who used to write is Poppy Z. Bright. And I think actually his books are still published as Poppy Zebrae, even though he has since transitioned and has a new name. And I do know it. I've written columns about it. I've just forgotten. Um, and I think it was Lost Souls. It, is it a problematic book in some ways? Yes, it is. It, it, it has some very sort of explicit rape scenes that I think when, when you look back now, because they're kind of portrayed as slightly sexy. And I think, so I think through a modern lens, it's a bit of a thing, but that was the book. So two books, actually, first of all, Forever, when we were about 11, that was the book that you would, you'd be in a classroom and you'd turn, I think it's page 90 in Forever, and you'd open it and you'd pass it. Oh my God, the penis is called Ralph. And you know, and you would share that bit kind of, but then when we were 16, 17 in the sixth form common room, obviously by that point, we it was, pure height of satanic panic you're not allowed to listen to marilyn manson as it turns out they might have had a point um and we were all sharing lost souls because it was incredibly graphic it was it was um male male gay sex scenes and they were vampires you know so it was all really hot and that was a glimpse at right okay this is interesting this speaks to me more than any other sex scene i've ever read but then when I was, I think, 18, I was at college and I was talking about moving to Brighton and my friend, my best friend, Kerry, had got there before me and she was she was part of this committee, like, you have to move to Brighton, you've just got to do it. And so she sent me my first copy of Tales of the City and saying, P.S. Brighton is a bit like San Francisco. And she was right. You know, it was cruising in the supermarkets. Um, it was sort of bathhouses and saunas and and you know w within my time in Brighton when I got there so I moved to Brighton when I was 20 you know I arrived as a Marianne Singleton sort of wide-eyed very innocent very sort of provincial then I became a Mouse Tolliver and then I became an Anna Madrigal you know and and I think it, that that book and having sorry this is so, so name droppy having met armistead since and sort of been joined his little gang in london you know i think that was almost deliberate you know that wherever you were in the queer community i think you were meant to see yourself in that family and it did for me really cement this notion of letting go of my biological family and realizing the power of the logical family because i realized that's what I had done. That's what I had found in Brighton. So I think, I know everyone says Tales of the City, but it did, it, it really did change. It changed me on a very sort of deep level, I think. Any more for any more? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, I wanna thank Juno for being here. Can we all thank Juno for being here? Thank you.